and welcome to The Simple Actor. Hey guys, thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have Xavier Rubiano join us this morning. Um, Xavier, hey Xavier. Um, Xavier is from Tara Rubin Casting in New York and currently he casts companies of Phantom of the Opera, Kiss My Aztec, Karate Kid, um, and really wants to share his journey of getting into casting um, as well as his early years, um, especially being an ANDA alum. Um, we're really excited to hear um, what Xavier also has to share for you guys with regards to hopping into the business, especially for those of you who are graduating um, and how the changing landscape of casting with regards to um, representation, equity, inclusion, and also just where we are in the middle of a pandemic, um, sending in tapes, et cetera, what you guys can do um, to make it uh, the best material and package as you're sending in your uh, auditions. So thank you so much, Xavier, for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to Great. speak with you all. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Xavier, I just want to start out because there was a really great quote that you had in an article I read about you. Um, and you said, I want to see who you are, your energy, your light, and how I can use that for a show I'm currently casting or for something else that someone else is casting in my office. And I love this quote because a lot of times the big question for young actors and casting directors is like, what if I go in and I'm wrong? Why would I do that? What What's happening behind the table and in those rooms and in those offices um, that I don't know about? Um, so what can you say to just that quote before we start hearing about your journey? Sure. Um, that, that quote comes from the idea that, you know, we are all individuals and we all have different things about ourselves that make us unique and interesting. And those are the things that I'm most interested in especially if I haven't met you before, or this is the first time we're interacting in a room or on self-tape or on Zoom or whatever. Um, and so I think a, for actors, and I think it takes a lot of the pressure off of them, is that like, it's don't worry about what you think we are looking for. Let me worry about that. Let me worry about like, this is what I need. Just come into the room and show me what you have to offer. And then I can see where that fits. Um, because that's the thing that you have most control over is yourself. So I want you, I want people to share that in the room. Um, and then I can go from there and be like, oh, you know, this person showed me a quality that I didn't think um, this character could have, but, but maybe they can change my mind about that. Maybe we can play around with that. Um, so those are the things that I, I look for most for when I first meet somebody um, via tape or Zoom or live in person. Great. That's great. And we're going to dive into that more at the end of the interview. Um, but first, take us all the way back. I love to go all the way back. How did you fall in love with theater? Sure. Um, so um, I am a born and raised New Yorker. I grew up in Jackson Heights, Queens. Um, and I grew up dancing. My older sister was took dance classes and I had to take dance classes because she's my older sister and I look, looked up to her. And so that's how I got into the stage is through dance. Um, so I went to perform arts high school um, called Frank Sinatra School of the Arts. Mm -hmm. And I was a dance major. My junior year, they started a musical theater minor program that I can take in addition to my dance classes. And um, I got to see my first Broadway show through my high school. So I knew from the beginning that like, I wanted to sing, dance and act at some point in my life, be it through dance or whatever. Um, so when this opportunity came to audition for the musical theater minor, I was excited about it um, and I got in and um, I decided that I wanted to pursue musical theater for college. Um, and that's when I applied to a bunch of schools and I got into AMDA, New York, and I went there for my conservatory. Um, and then right as I was graduating conservatory, they had just started the BFA program. Literally like if I graduated in the spring semester, the summer semester was the first BFA <laughs> semester. <laughs> and so I took the summer off and joined in the fall. And, and that's how I got into musical theater. That's how I fell in love with it. That's great. And you said that, you know, going through the process at AMDA, that's where you started to have like these inklings about casting. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I'm going to age myself 
Um, <laughs> when I, my, first, <laughs> my first semester, um, the Drowsy Chaperone had just started playing on Broadway. Yeah. And I was picking material for my final demo and I wanted to do Alfonso. And I couldn't find sheet music anywhere because the show had just opened. It wasn't published. I couldn't go to Colony. I couldn't go, you know, to find it. Um, and so the, the accompanist in my musical theater class suggested I contact the casting office. And I was like, what's that? I was like 18. I was like, what are you talking about? A casting office. And so I literally called Telsing Company and I was like, hey, I'm a first semester in college. I'm looking for the sheet music. Do you think you can give me a copy? And they said, sure, you're good, <laughs> whatever. Um, and so I went to their office to pick it up and I'm like, oh, what is this world that I'm walking into? And this was back in their old office where it was like, you know, the, the brown couches and like the big studios and you're just like, all their posters of all the shows they've done. You're like, what is happening? And so there, therefore I was like, oh, this is like a real job. This is something that, that people per do professionally. You know, you don't think about like in high school and college, it's like you're the faculty casts the show. And so you just assume that maybe it's just like the director or like that picks the people, but there's so much more to the process. There are people hired to do the search for the teams. Um, and so I always knew in the back of my mind that that was something that I was like super interested in. Um, and, you know, as, as I learned more about understudies and musical theater history and all of that, the more I was like interested in that side of the process of like how we come together and find the people to put on the show. Um, and so after I graduated, I took a year of uh, auditioning and then I decided like, let me actually try and see if this is a real thing that I could pursue or something that I would enjoy doing. And so it, like literally like a year after I graduated, I did my first internship. And since then I've, uh, I've been in casting for now 11 years. That's amazing. That's amazing. I love the story about coming to New York and being like, oh, wait, this is a job because I felt the same way when I got to New York. And and even seeing some of the same casting directors, like Tara Rubin actually cast me in my first production contract. And I remember seeing her multiple times as I was like a grad student in New York. And, you know, and I was like, oh, you have relationship with this whole other side of the industry that mm -hmm. didn't really exist before you get to the market, you know, and yeah discovering that was just really cool. And I was like, what do you do? Like, how do you, how does this work? How do you get to know people? So um, when you got started interning and then started casting like your first year in, what did you learn from the other side of the table? That a, a lot, a lot. There's a lot of like the boring stuff, like the admin stuff. There's a lot of it. There's so much that goes into preparing an actor for an audition collecting can you talk side. about that a little yeah. bit talk about that like especially now where they're sending you like huge files of everything because you're not even coming into rooms can you talk about what that yeah. is so you know it there's the conversations that we have with the creative team like let's say we're casting a new project um we have these um, conversations and, and we talk about like we had, we, we, read the, we read the script, we listen to the music, we familiarize with, with the show itself, same process that actors do. We have to familiarize with what we're gonna be looking for. Um, and then we can then have a conversation with the writers, the director, the producers about like, what, it, what are your ideas of who the, these characters are and should be or could be we, and then we go back and forth and have those conversations and then really have a clear picture of like, okay, now that we know what we're looking for, I need music, I need sides, I need um, to, I need to get spaces booked. I need to look at the calendar. When, when are you all available? When am I available? There's so much like scheduling that happens beforehand. And are you in charge of all of that scheduling? Like all the yeah. people getting everybody there together. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, and and then from there, when we have all the dates set, we can then start inviting people to auditions. And then um, 
then we deal with that schedule of like, okay, this person is only available for these two hours. Okay, maybe I can switch this person around and around and around um, until we have a, a schedule. And then we've got to get sites printed, a, a reader books printed, buy, like a accompanist books printed, uh, you know, sites for the actors in case they forgot them at home. Just make sure that everything is prepared. Pencils, pens, uh, you know, um, make sure we have a hard copy of the schedule for our creative team to have to write their notes on and all of that happens and then we have auditions and that's even before you see anyone that's before, <laughs> before you, see you see anybody right yeah <laughs> wow so that's all the admin stuff that's yeah. like that, that people don't see that I, actors don't see yeah um and then in the room what I've learned a lot is that and I tell this to every single actor, like preparation is key. It is like the most important thing um, that the most important tool you have is to be prepared. Um, it's, I've seen people crash and burn because of not being prepared enough or not just doing like that extra bit of homework or, you know, just like the little bits that of information that we give you, like hold on to it find out more, see if there's reason, like look people up, see what they're about before coming in the room. Um, and those, those, the actors that do that extra preparation, I feel are the most successful because they are more grounded, they're more confident. They um, are, the nerves and the anxieties are, are limited at that point, you know, because there's not, because you've done all you can. And you, and when you can stand on your own two feet and say like, I did all this work and I feel proud of the work I'm about to do, though, that I think those are the most successful auditions that I've sat through. Yeah. And what do you say to the actors who, and I've been on both sides of it, right? Like I've been the super prepared, I'm ready to go. And then the actor who's like, I just got this a day and a half ago. I've had a million things to do or not even a day, maybe the night before. I remember going in to like see Sondheim getting a call the night before. And I'm like, OMG, um, what do you say to the actor who's like, you, I've gotten so many pages. It's a night before thing. What do you expect when you know, okay, we're calling in people last minute. Like there was stuff even during like right before the holidays where they were like, we know this is short on time. We know people may be sick or not sick. We're just trying to get people in. What do you say in those scenarios to actors who are freaking out over the time? Yeah. Uh time is like a, such a luxury isn't it like i wish i had more time to do all the prep work and for for my to give actors time as well yeah, yeah. um i a good casting director knows the limitations of the time you were given and they would give grace and it, like just let like let you know that um just focus on this if you have time to look at the other stuff great but you know the this is this scene and this song is the most important thing. If you look at the other two scenes and the other two songs, that's an, that's an extra thing, but like, don't worry about it. Um, and so I would often encourage people to just ask if it's like, do I have to prepare all of this? And, and, and the, the worst case scenario is yes. Yeah. Um, but I think asking the question, it's, and I don't think is harmful. It's to be like, you know, this is the night before it's on time. Yeah. It's seven eighths, <laughs> you know, nine twelves, whatever time signature it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. That's um, helpful to hear. I feel like that's so helpful to hear because you get those questions. And again, a lot of actors, even older actors, actors, veteran actors who've been around realizing that casting directors, not agents, as you've said, no such thing. <laughs> casting directors are people um, and they get it but they also expect you to come in and be a professional too, right? Yeah. Like, so if you're coming in last minute, um, you've got to still just make it happen and do the best that you can. Yeah, and I often, and I also tell directors as uh, that as well. If like somebody comes in the room and they're like a little nervous or they weren't as like as prepared as some of the others, I, I will tell them, I was like, that person just got the material last night. Yeah. Like I will yeah. always like let, others know the situation that right. like don't I've seen them do better I know they're great it's just that they got this material last minute so please great. If, if you see something give them a chance because I can vouch for them yeah and I love that like 
I guess that kind of goes to kind of your journey as you've gone further down the road into being a casting director and the relationships. And can you talk about building relationships with actors over periods of time? Because again, I build a relationship with Tara, you know, over a period of time where she got to know my work before I was cast in anything by her. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, that's like, I like, that's the best part of the job. One of the best things about the job is that I get to see actors grow over time and see them like mature and become a fully, fully realized human um, over time. And, and so the hardest part, someone told this to me once, the hardest part is like, is that very first time. Once you have that first time in the room with them, every other time is just gonna get easier and easier and easier. Um, and that's why I'm like, I want you to see who you are first. I want to see, share who you are, share your soul, share your light so that I can hold on to something and remember you for the next time and then see how you grow as an artist and as an actor. Um, and I know so many actors, I, when I first started in casting, I first started on like non-equity tours. And now 11 years later, those people that I first met 11 years ago are now on Broadway and are now doing great things, are now on television and like our film. And so it's been incredible to see people's journeys in, in those, in that time. And so, yeah, I think for actors, it's just like showing up and doing your best work and being confident and, and, um, being proud of your work and and just trusting that the process that like we're if it doesn't happen now it might happen next time so keep showing up and keep showing up better than you did before you know that's great that's so great and i guess you know thinking about um you've given us so much information about you as a casting director how would you describe yourself in the room like what are your vibes like when people meet you and over time or they're like oh Xavier is blank like what are your in the room and I mean even when you're looking at self-tapes or zooming people you know zoom auditions what kind of do you give out as a casting director I hope I give out like kindness and openness and and even a little bit of fun um I don't like to like I take the job seriously but I also know that it's like we're like we're storytellers um and we are, we're all trying to, to achieve the same goal. Um, and so that's what I hope. Um, I also have to be mindful of like, I, I, you know, I'm a New Yorker and I can't have RBF sometimes. So I'm like always <laughs> constantly like a, aware of my, my face and making sure that I am <laughs> smiling as much as possible and being open. Um, um, but yeah, I always, and, and you know, it all, it, it starts before people walk in the room as well. Like when I greet them out in the hallway, I have, you know, I always make sure that you have everything you need, that you're good, that you're, that, you know, if you need a couple of extra minutes, just let me know. Um, I try to be as, as chill and, and, and low stakes for the actors as possible, just to like calm their nerves. Cause I know it's always anxiety can, can be a big thing for people. So I try and, and make sure that if they see that I'm calm, they'll be calm. Yeah. Internally, I could be freaking out. I could be like, oh my God, <laughs> we're 15 minutes behind. <laughs> like people are hungry. Like, <laughs> and and so I just like try to not let anyone else see that. And then like problem solve on my own. Yeah. Like in a like texting an assistant, being like, okay, we're gonna need like coffee soon, like things like that to make sure that they're my team is good and the actors don't sense any sort of weird vibes. Yeah. I try to minimize as many crazy vibes as I can. Yeah. No, that's so, that's so good. And that's so thoughtful because again, I don't think actors know that you're balancing all of those um, environments at one time. Um, And I feel like most casting directors I've met in New York do that well, but not everybody. (laughs) 
everybody does that well. Yeah. So that's really great. And I'm, I'm sure you just being an actor also realizes, you know, what it's like to be on the Definitely. outside of the room waiting to go in, right? Definitely. Yeah. Part of the reason why I left acting was because of the feeling, like the anxiety yeah. that I would get. I needed much more control over my life. I didn't realize how type A I was until I like got into casting and I was like, oh, the the sort of admin work is like, and the creative side, it's a perfect balance for me um, in terms of like my own mental health. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get you. I mean, it's why I took a step back from performing because I was like, I feel like I want a little more control, but also I loved kind of the service aspect of acting, which is why mm -hmm. I went into teaching more. Um, and I still, you know, act on the side, but it, it's true. Just depending on your personality, sometimes you need that balance where yeah, you're like, this is absolutely. too many things outside of my hands right now. Yeah, 100%, 100%. <laughs> 100%. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about you coming in, especially early in your career as a Latino casting director. Were there many casting directors of colors that you came into contact with? Were you often the only in the room? What was that journey like for you? <clears throat> yeah, so at the time that I started, there was only one other in New York that I could think of, and that was Cesar Rocha. And he's only like a year or two older than me. So he must have been like an intern assistant as I was just graduating school. Um, and and so it often felt like I was the only one, not even just Latino, only person of color, blank statement. Like I didn't know any other black casting directors. I didn't know any other Asian casting directors um, or Latino at the time that I first started. Um, so it often felt that yes, I was always the only one in the room and and a part of it was like, I, I, I dealt with this a lot over the last couple of years of that, like my, where, where I stand in my own privilege, you know, like I am Latino, but I do have fair skin and I am a man. So like, where, where does my intersectionality cut? Like, it, is that why I got in the room? Like a lot of the confrontation is that, is that why? Cause am I a man? Am I in this room because I'm fair skinned? There was a lot of like, reckoning that I had over the last couple of years mm. um, with that. That said, like it became clear very fast how important it was for me to stay in the business and stay in the rooms and stay in casting because there were no other voices like mine and there was no one. So like there was also that sort of, I, want, I don't want to say pressure, but it, there was um, a responsibility for to to be that voice, um, and you know, I didn't have that sort of um, authority at the beginning of my career. It wasn't until like the last three years that I really felt comfortable to be to 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 voice to feel like I had enough space to express myself, um, and so it wasn't a, so. My second internship was at Stuart Whitley and Andrea Z, who was an Asian woman, was um, the associate there. And having her there was very helpful. It really like solidified that like, this is where I need to be. This is what I'm doing. Like, this is why I have to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been great over the last two years to have met other BIPOC casting directors in New York who I had never met before or were ever able to cross paths with. And now there's like a great network of people that I am friends with, that I adore, and I'm so happy to have um, support me and for me to support them. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been the, where we were 11 years ago when I first started and now is like, so it's changed so much can definitely go further. It can always go further, um, but definitely we're moving in the right direction in terms of like where we're at in the industry on, on casting side. That's great, Xavier. And I, I just kind of want to dig in a little deeper on that because I remember again, 
I'm always aging myself, but my first years in New York when we had black and white headshots still, um, <laughs> like back in the day, um, I remember the joke, even when I was doing my first couple of shows was like, you know, who's the token, right? Like, oh, oh I'm the one, or maybe there's a, a, a black, you know, woman or a black man or a person, yeah. one person of color in the show. And that was like, oh, we're the tokens, you know, like, and that was kind of a cynical joke and that we knew what that meant. Um, but as you've been in rooms, as you've, you know, been casting projects, especially like you said, over the last three years, have you seen even the approach to like, you know, before the word was like colorblind casting um, back in the day, and now it's like color conscious or, you know, what have you seen in terms of how you're bringing in actors for different roles that maybe 10, 11 years ago, you guys would have just said, no, you know, maybe we're just gonna have one person of color in the cast. Yeah, that's a great question. And there, there has been a shift. There's, I've been having lots more conversations about like how, if we do change this person's race, what does that mean for the story? We're having those conversations. Does it need to change the story? It might not need to change the story. Um, and and I'm glad that we're getting away from the token, tokenism and tokenization of it. Um, I probably shouldn't talk about this too much, but I am gonna talk about it. Um, I joined Dear Van Hansen right when the sh show opened on Broadway as an assistant. Yeah. And then I took over it um, like a year or year and a half into um, the Broadway run, right as the tour was finished casting. And um, a big thing that I had, the big thing that I struggled with on that show was um, besides Alana, where else can we add people of color um, in, the, in, the, in the show? Like, where can we, can Zoe be a person of color? Can Connor, can Evan, can like who, who, where can we, so that it's not just one person of color on that stage. Um, and it was, a, it was a constant like tug of war of like, of between the writers, between the director, between the producer, between us, like where we can give in and stuff. And then after a while, I just like stopped having that conversation. I just started, just started showing people and then um, we ended up having Yvonne Hernandez and Ann Sanders at one point. So we had a Latino dad and an Asian mom mm -hmm. as the Murphys. And it didn't change the story. It didn't, like, we didn't have to talk about it. They brought their own experiences to it, you know, as, as any actor should. But I think it finally, like, made them realize, like, oh, this can work. And it's, okay. it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's uh, okay. Yeah. The show's still open. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> so, okay. Like, yeah. We're still making money. Yeah. Um, so so I think that was they were finally like, great, let's move in that direction. Um, there have been shows where from the very beginning it's been like, where what does this mean if we make uh let's talk about the outsiders for a second. Sure. If, um the greasers, um should be a mix of races um, and let's make the socias white people because that's it's a story about class but let's add race on top of that and let's see what um what that does with the storytelling and in those relationships inside the two groups of people what do the inter like what do the platonic relationships look like what does it mean to have johnny cade be an indigenous person what does that mean if we make um his like mentor not his mentor but like uh dallas winston the person who he, who he looks up to the most what if that's a black person or what if that's an indigenous person what are those two different relationships like if we make johnny k indigenous so those are conversations that we're constantly having on on different shows um so it's been it's been exciting to have these conversations. It's been good to have these conversations because, you know, back when I was at the beginning of my career, I was just like, you know, I'm in casting. I'm not doing brain surgery. I'm, it's like not, not the most important, it's not important. But then as I got older, it is important. 
Casting is important. Representation matters is what we learned and established, right? And that's because culture changes with media. And so who we put into narratives can change culture and can change storytelling and can change literally world's perceptions about people. Look at um, just even telling stories of like, look at the success of Parasite and, and Squid Game. Like w Korea has become a place where we look for stories because we're looking for different and original ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the success of like um, Insecure, we wouldn't have gotten Harlem without Insecure. So like, so like we can change the conversations by changing casting, you know?